If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5 this morning. James chapter 5. It's our honor to have Brother Tim and Cindy Harris with the Good Samaritan Radio Ministry. And um, I appreciate the many, many times that I have uh, thought about the trips we took down there, or the trip. Maybe we had two trips, I'm not sure. It was about 10 years ago. Maybe it was longer than that. It might have been 15 years ago. And I preached to almost a thousand people in a Christian school in the middle of Honduras. And then I baptized so many people uh, that I thought my feet were going to turn into web feet. Amen. They let the visiting preacher preach. And uh, they told me after uh, about halfway through the baptism service that uh, there was, those rivers were known for snakes. And I'll never forget it, Brother Harris. Uh, as I was baptizing, there was, there was this long limb. It was going downstream, and it hit me in the side. And um, I tell you what, uh, <clears throat> I got close to the Lord during that baptism service, amen, because <laughs> I thought I was coming home, amen. But anyway, uh, it was some precious memories and great ministry, and I've heard that uh, God is really doing some great work down there. And uh, I know that Bob and Joan Tyson were uh, part of the mission program of Centel Baptist Church when my wife was a little girl. And uh, so uh, as soon as Brother Bob came by here, uh, we took him on immediately, and we still support him, and we thank God for that ministry. And I want you to pray for the Hamiltree family. I know this has <clears throat> brought up some uh, uh, precious memories, and it's hard. And how many of y'all have lost a loved one in your family? Raise your hand. You've lost a loved one in your family. So, you know, I want you to make a, a, a pledge and a promise to continue to pray for this dear family. Amen. They come here to honor their, <clears throat> their loved one. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got uh, Illinois dust down my throat, amen, praise God. I had to have an interpreter up there because they're all Yankees, and uh, um, they're having a drought. But I want to tell you something, every service, the little, the little church was packed, and Brother Ryan's got a problem. The building zone will not let them build anything under another roof. 
And so they, they don't know what they're going to do because they're just they're 90% full and God is using them up there in a special way. I'm glad I could go up and fruit inspect. You know, it's the fruit of your account. You've had a part in their ministry. You've helped raise them. Uh, you've taught them. And I know that their parents of Adam and, uh, and the Stiles, are, they're excited and thrilled that they're in the perfect will of God. And I thank God for that. This Wednesday, they got a very strange missionary going to be there. It's going to be Mark Coffey. Amen. And he's going to have a bunch of t-shirts. And uh, he's following up on Wednesday night service. And we're excited about this missions revival coming up this Sunday. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew, uh, excuse me, James chapter 5 and verse 7. Uh, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning and the Lord t- told me that I had to go back and preach something that I thought I'd preach, but I haven't covered this. And I was just going to skip to the last uh, few verses and preach on prayer. And the Lord didn't give me peace about it. Maybe tonight I'll be able to do that. Uh, but I want to preach on patience again uh, because y'all really need it. <laughs> no, because no, I really need it. Amen. We all need more patience. But don't pray for patience because to get patience, you're going to have to go through what Job went through sometimes. And uh, there's trials and tribulation. But there's three characters here that uh, James brings up. It's a farmer, uh, doesn't name him, and then the prophets, and then also Job. Three great illustrations of how you ought to have patience. But the reason you ought to have patience, and that word really uh, inclines to the word endurance and faithfulness, is because the Lord's coming soon. How many believe that? Say amen. Even so, come quickly, is what our prayer should be. Because I believe that, folks, the signs of the time are everywhere. Amen. I believe He's coming, and He's coming soon. There's not one prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. Now, all, these, all these things going on, this Middle East conflict and this Korean conflict, a crazy man running a country. I mean, he's absolutely a lunatic. He's insane. I believe he's demon-possessed. And folks, that's a sign of the last days. Jesus is coming soon. And the admonition this morning is, be faithful and be patient because the Lord's coming soon. Let's stand on the Word of God, verses 7 through 12. The Bible says in James chapter 5, you with me? This is a book on growing up, being mature. I think Christians ought to grow up. I think we ought to be mature, not babies in in the faith. The only way to do that is through the sincere milk of the Word of God. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. In other words, it don't happen overnight. And then, and then this is a great verse. It says, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, that's the second illustration, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endured. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy, and, and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of being home. Lord, I I love preaching here more than I love preaching anywhere in the world. And I thank you, dear God, for the many years that we've had together as a church, family, and God, the many uh, times that we've had a victory and and, uh, triumph and joy, but also, God, the times that we've shared of heartaches and pains and suffering and trials and tribulation. God, that we have a church family that can bear one another's burdens and God, we can carry each other's sorrows to the throne of God and the throne of grace and find help in the time of need. So Lord, thank you for this church. God, help us to continue to be the kind of church that uh, loves souls and loves each other. God, give us patience. God, give us the patience of Job. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, there was three illustrations James 
uh, begins to talk about on this establishing yourself, being stable in the last days, being patient for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And he uses a farmer. He uses a farmer. Last week, we uh, honored a farmer, uh, Brother Lamar Jenkins, 80th birthday. I hope he read my letter because I don't write letters to anybody, amen. But uh, I appreciate the way Brother Jason honored him at the end of the service Sunday night. I was watching. We was in a different time zone. I didn't skip church. And um, I just thank God for uh, farmers. Farmers have patience. I can't grow hair, so I, I know I can't, I can't even grow tomatoes. I can't grow nothing. But I, I tell you what, I appreciate farmers. I was in Claxton, Georgia for four years, and I want to tell you something. Farmers are special people, but I'm going to tell you what, uh, what, uh, what one of the qualities of a farmer is. They're patient. They're patient in season, out of season. Matter of fact, orange juice is going sky high because I'm going to tell you, these farmers down in South uh, Florida lost everything they had. And I mean all the crops. And, and folks, we're spiritual farmers. We're looking for a spiritual harvest. And I want to tell you something. God's blessing this church in a miraculous way in, the, in these last few months. And I'm so excited about it. I'm excited about how many visitors we're having and, and souls being saved. But I want to tell you this, friend. It's not always that way. There's some uh, valleys and there's some uh, times that uh, we need to plow and we need to sow. You know, the reason we go on visitation next Saturday morning is that we believe every teacher ought to return the visit to every student that visits the class. I believe it's a personal ministry. I don't believe you're qualified to teach 30 unless you're willing to visit one. Amen? I don't think I'm qualified to preach to 300 or 200 or 100 unless I'm willing to plant the seed to one. I'm just convicted of that. That's the way the church started 39 and three-fourths years ago. That's the way it's going to continue to grow, is that we care enough to plant the seed in the hearts of souls individually. Amen? That we go to the homes, and we go to the jobs, and we go to the malls, and we plant the Word of God. But folks, if you think everybody's going to get saved every time you visit, you got another thought coming, say amen, because sometimes they will not be uh, uh, receptive They'll be eating spaghetti. It'll be all over their face. And they don't want to be, they don't want to be uh, uh, you inter interrupting them. And the best thing you to do is throw a track in the door and leave. Amen. And leave the oil, the hinges old with kindness and be a gentleman and a lady and plant the seed. But I've had it happen where a person slammed the door on my foot, threw the track in there, and 3 o'clock the next morning he wakes up, reads the track, gets saved, and calls me up and apologizes for slamming the door in my face. And then gets baptized in a neighboring church. I wonder why he didn't get baptized here. A neighboring church and said, I, my preacher said I ought to apologize to anyone I've offended. I thought about the time I slammed the door in your face. But praise God, I got the track in the door. Praise God. Amen. And he caught it about 3 o'clock the next morning. The Word of God's the seed. But folks, we got to sow it. We sow it with tears, the first rain. We sow, we sow it. Uh, so it with mourning, the latter rain. And folks, it's a spiritual harvest. And then the prophets. Thank God, friend. If you think serving God's easy, you got another thought coming too. Because I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it takes your life. The word uh, witness, the root word for that is martyr in the Greek. And folks, many people have given their lives for Christ's sake. And so James is saying, hey, be patient. Be stable. Don't give up. Look at the farmer. And look at the prophet, but I like the last one, and that's one I was going to skip over, and the Holy Ghost wouldn't let me, and I thank God He wouldn't, because I've been blessed just studying this morning about it. And that's Job. You know, Job ought to be your hero. Job's not a quitter. Job, uh, folks, is not a fair-weather Baptist. Job, thank God, thank God. He, uh, he uh, was faithful uh, when he lost it all. And that's hard to do. That's hard. Somebody say amen. It's hard to be faithful when your heart's broken. It's hard to be faithful when God seemingly didn't answer your prayer. Or you, uh, He answered in a different way than you designed. And folks, I want to tell you something. We need to realize that God has called us to have the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the faithfulness and the patience of Job. I want you to turn back to Job chapter 1. We're going to be there the rest of the morning. In the afternoon, not really. And, and uh, you know, i got to make up for lost time here. But I want you to see this. It says in Job chapter 1 that, folks, it teaches us to stand when we don't understand. Stand when we don't understand. Let me just say this real quick. Most people don't notice you when everything's going good. 
They notice you when they think that you're going to quit. And when the platform is full of tears and there's, there's problems in your life and there's trials in your life, they're going to see if you're a real Christian. And so the greatest time to shine is when it's darkest. Say amen. The greatest time to shine is when you feel like not shining. And when you feel like you're the lowest of low and you want to give up. I imagine Job felt that way. And folks, the Bible says that James said, take the, 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 uh, the, the lesson from this man of God named Job. So I go back to Job chapter 1, and I see in verse 7 what was happening behind the scenes that he didn't know about, that was in heaven. There's a war going in heaven every day trying to get you to quit, trying to get you to recant, trying to get you to sin. And verse 7 says this, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And when Satan answered, Job chapter 1 verse 7, you with me? And it says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. What was he doing going to and fro in the earth? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's living up to his name. He's the slanderer. That's what Satan means. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so what he's doing, he's trying to find someone to slander. By the way, when you slander, you're like the devil. Amen? When you slander someone, you're living up to your father in hell and not heaven. Because I'm going to tell you something. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's trying to, find, trying to find fault with everybody. He's critical, cynical, and he's satanic because he's Satan. So the slander comes. His name is Satan. That's what the word means. And we see in verse 8, he says, And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered thy servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and excuse evil. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. I thank God the Lord could recommend Job. I thank God the Lord could recommend uh, one, while the slander's looking for somebody to slander, Jesus is looking for somebody to recommend. And folks, he's recommending a man that feared him. You know what fearing God means? God knows. You know what fearing God means? It's an awesome dread of displeasing God. That ought to be your awesome dread. Brother Scott came up to me during handshaking time and says, you're going to get my truck towed off. I said, no, no, no. We're about 50-50 bulldogs, uh, uh, hound dogs. It'll be all right. Praise God. Just rest. Amen. Settle down. Amen. It'll be okay. Now I'm notified who's got the big flags out there. But anyway, <laughs> Job was, was being slandered by Satan, but God said, hey, my man fears me. My man eschews evil. Can that be said about you? That's a great testimony. Hallelujah. And look at this. In verse 9, the Bible says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? See, here's the accuser of the brethren. He wants you, he wants you to serve God for what you can get out of God. He wants you to serve. He, he thinks that's why you're here tonight, for let's make a deal. He wants, you to, he wants you to be one that bargains with God's love. Folks, I want to tell you what, we need to love God like He loves us unconditionally. Amen? We need to love God unreservedly. We need to love God impartially. We need to love God immediately, as soon as possible, no matter what happens. We need to serve God and love God in season, out of season, when things are going great, when things are not going so good. And folks, the reason is because we love Him for who He is and what He's already done. He died for us. He was buried for us. And He arose for us. Is that not enough to love God for? And He purchased your salvation. And you're going to heaven instead of hell. Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't say hallelujah too much up there. They didn't know what that meant. I uh, mean, it was hallelujah. No, but not really. And I love them and thank God for them. Amen. But they were probably glad to see me get out. I said, Brother Ron, do you mind me walking around? You've got an all wood pulpit pl platform like, like ours. I said, can I? He said, well, we don't really move around much. I said, well, I got to. And I was up and down the house and everywhere else. But I want to tell you something, friend. Thank God for their love for their pastor and their pastor's wife and their assistant pastor. And I thank God, friend, that the devil wants to accuse churches of serving God for what they can get out of God. We need to be faithful for what God's already done. Amen. Look at verse 10. 
It says, has thou made a hedge about him? How did Satan know about the hedge? He's been trying to get in through it. He's been trying to penetrate it. And he, and he says, and about his house and about all that he hath on every side, hath he blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the hand. And he said, but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, God said, and he'll curse thee to thy face. He said, and, but put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Folks, I want to tell you something. Satan was saying he only loves you for what he can get. And you've bribed him. You've bribed him. That's a terrible, slanderous, satanic accusation. But that's the devil. Amen? And the devil says you're in it for what you can get out of it. But folks, I want to tell you something. We ought to be faithful for what we've already experienced. And that's eternal salvation. Amen? And I want to tell you something. Job cursed the day that he was born, but he never cursed God. Amen? He never recanted. Folks, I want to tell you something, friend. It's not for what you can get out of somebody. I heard about a man and his wife who were moving into a beautiful, uh, beautiful home, and he was, uh, it was a wealthy one, and, and uh, she had inherited money. And she said, Harold, I want you to know that uh, if it weren't for my money, we wouldn't have this beautiful place, this beautiful house. And then they looked out there, and there was a beautiful car out there, and she just preached on and said, Harold, I want you to know we wouldn't have that beautiful car out there if it wasn't for my money. And he said, look at this furniture they're moving here. We wouldn't have any of this furniture if it wasn't for my money. And Harold just sort of slumped down a little bit. And, and he said, well, I understand. But I'll tell you something. You wouldn't have me if it wasn't for your money. <laughs> <laughs> and folks, I don't think you ought to marry anybody for your money. Because, folks, sometimes it would be cheaper to just go out and get a loan. <laughs> Amen. But I want to tell you something, folks. You shouldn't get in this and be faithful for what you can get out of it. Folks, we're not bargaining with God. We're not bartering with God. Folks, God has blessed us. He's blessed us with money that things money cannot buy. And folks, the government can't tax. I'm preaching now. Say amen. And folks, I want you to know this. The ministry sometimes of thorns, as the Apostle Paul said, that causes us to realize the sufficient grace of God. You know, if there was never rain, we wouldn't know where the leaks were in this place. If there was never a storm, we wouldn't know how great it is to have air conditioning and food. And uh, We need to take up a love offering in, during the missions conference for those dear missionaries down there. They're having babies in their home and bringing the babies to the, to the hospitals down in Puerto Rico. And the spears are down there, and she's uh, seven months pregnant, and they won't leave. And they're ministering because they said, God has called us to Puerto Rico, and we're not leaving after the storm. It's devastated down there. I mean, it's millions and billions of dollars uh, of damage, and no electricity for months, and no lights, and the hospital's got to shut down, and all kinds of things going on. And I thank God there's a missionary down there standing saying, God's called us to this place to minister. That's faithfulness. But Job's distress is found in Job chapter 2, in verse 9, he lost everything but his wife. And then his wife said, why don't you commit suicide? That's exactly what she said. Chapter 2, verse 9 says, Then said his wife unto him, As thou not still retain thy integrity, curse God and die. Now folks, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I got a wife that uh, doesn't advise me on such things like that. You know, why don't you just curse God and quit? No, folks, he had unexpected tragedy. We see in chapter 1, verse 13 through 18, he lost his fortune. In chapter 1, verse 18, he lost his family. In chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, he lost his fitness, his health. In chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says he lost his reputation. I didn't say his testimony and his character. In chapter 2 of Job, verse 11, the Bible says this. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all the evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz and Temanite and Bildad. And they, and they, and they, said, they said, It must be something wrong with you, and you must have sin in your life, summarizing the rest of the chapter. 
He lost his reputation. And then Job chapter 19, verse 13 through 14 and verse 19, he lost his friends. So he lost his fortune, he lost his family, he lost his fitness, he lost his face, he lost his friends. What did he do? And this is what we ought to do in the last days in conclusion. Today. Don't pack up, I'm just, this is my first closing. But I want you to see in Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, what Job did. And you read it, Job 1, 20? It says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head. See, that is a sign of spirituality. Isn't it? No. Shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and what's the last word, class? Worshipped. You know, I want to tell you something, friend. It's a sad day when things happen wrong and then you blame it on God. It's a sad day when the baby dies and you never come back to church and get bitter. But it's happened in the history of this church. And folks, it's a sad day when things and tragedies take place and people become bitter. Not only at others, but at God. And Satan the slanders laughing from the pit of hell saying, I knew it. They were serving God when everything was just hunky-dory. That's South Georgian for everything was splendid. But what did he do in verse 21? And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Choir, I've never heard you sing better than you sung this morning. It was beautiful. But the way of the cross was suffering. The way of the cross was self-denial. The way of the cross was heartache, being misunderstood, and even ridicule and persecution from his own people. But he didn't stop halfway up Calvary. He went all the way to the cross because he knew the fruit of that would be your salvation. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God, friend, that Jesus Christ did not go halfway up the cross. And then I see the unexplained mystery. Look at Job chapter. I see the unexpected tragedy in Job's life. But secondly, I see the unexplained mystery. In Job 13 verse 15. Would you, would you turn there please? Well, this would make me want to preach through the whole book of Job. In Job 13 verse 15. The Bible says this. Though he slay me. He's lost his friends, his family, his fitness, his health, his, his, his reputation to the neighbors, his fair weather friends. He's lost it all. But he says, though he slay me, yea, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He never lost his integrity. And that's where the words mentioned first in the Bible is in Job. Folks, listen, you can't trace God, you must trust Him. There's a lot of things I can't understand. There's a lot of things I don't understand. A preacher friend of mine, Brother uh, Campbell, Tim Campbell, uh, got the message out to pray for his church because Friday night, going home from the football game, one of his teachers in his Christian school, was killed instantly in a car accident. His little, the little adopted seven-year-old is in critical shape. And uh, I think his name's Ethan. And he might not make it. And here's a deacon, here's a faithful family, here's a Christian school teacher, and she's instantly taken out of this world. And some people would scratch their head and say, well, why? Well, folks, I don't know and Brother Campbell don't know, and I'm sure this afternoon when he preaches the funeral of this dear, faithful lady of God, he won't have the answers. But he'll have one that can comfort during the questions. Life is not a problem to be solved. It's a mystery to live. The book of Job tells us this. Don't live on explanations. Live by promises. God did not explain anything to Job. Nothing. He never answered Job's questions. Matter of fact, I'll show you in just a moment. He started asking Job questions. What do we do in the time of trials? What, how should we be patient? How should we endure in the last days? All by faith. It's by faith. 
It's not by figuring. It's not by focus. And it's not by finagling. That means trying to get by with your own willpower and your own strength. It's not enough. It's not enough. Job chapter 1 verse 21, back in Job chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible says that he, he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then in Job chapter 13 verse 15, he says, Though he slay me. Though he slay me. And folks, I want you to know as, as uh, Brother... Um, uh, uh, Kuykendall preached a tremendous message out of Job 23. Turn there just a second. Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. And then he goes on to say that uh, there is a, he said, he said in verse 8 of chapter Job 23, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backwards, but I cannot perceive him. Verse 9, Job 23, On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand. Then I cannot see him. I cannot see him. Folks, what he's saying is, I, I can't live on explanations. i got to live on promises because I can't see him. I can't feel Him. You ever been so low and so hurt that you can't see God? You can't feel God? You can't figure what's going on? I'm sure this dear family has been through this. But I love what he says in verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. See, gold takes heat. Gold takes scooping off all the dross. And they heat up and smelt that gold and, 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 and heat it uh, uh, with intense heat. And they keep scooping off the dross on the top of, those, uh, of that gold that they're smelting in the old days, in Job's days. And they knew that all the impurities out when the maker saw his image in the gold. And I want to tell you something, friend. God wants to see Himself in and through your life. And folks, sometimes, I'm, un, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, we get closer to God in the heat of the battle, in the problems of the day, in the heartache and heartbreaks of life than we do when everything is going great and our team wins by 41. Folks, this is not a game. This is life. And folks, I want to tell you something. Victory is won at Calvary, but victory is won when we see God is still there and God still cares. And the Bible says, My foot hath held His steps. His ways have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of His lips I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, folks, there's revival going to break out when we Baptists love God's word more than we love to eat. Say amen right there. And by the way, my wife knows when I'm sick, Brother Jim, it's when I can't eat. Any other time, I'm healthy. And I'm getting healthier, amen. I love to eat. I love to eat so much, I asked my wife at lunch, what's for supper? <laughs> I loved eating so much, I put in the GPS, favorite restaurants, praise God. Found one in Nashville Thursday. Porker's Peg Leg, praise God. <laughs> Wasn't a white person in the place, but I'm going to tell you, I never ate such good ribs in my life, amen. I recommend it highly, amen. But folks, I want to tell you something. I went through traffic, I went through uh, places in the, in the backwoods of Nashville I've never been in my life. Why? I want to get those ribs. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want to tell you something, friend. We as Baptists, we love to eat. Tennis will be up next Sunday night. But I'll tell you this. Folks, we ought to love God's Word more than we love to eat. You know why? Because when we're so heartbroken we can't eat, we need God. And when we're so confused we don't even know where the restaurant is, we need God. And I want to close with this. I want to show you the, the victory. I want to show you the victory. 
the unexplained mystery, but I want to show you the, the proclaimed victory in the book of Job real quick. I want you to know Job learned some great things in his sorrow. Number one, that God is sovereign. Does that word bother you? Sovereign. Look at Job 38, verse 1 through 4. Don't you love the Word of God? Amen. I'm getting blessed just reading it. Job 38, verse 1 through 4. The Bible says this, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth, darkeneth counsel my... Listen, who is this that darkeneth counsel my, by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee and answer thou, thou me. It says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? He didn't answer Job's questions. He started asking questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who has laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Or who has stretched out the line upon it? Folks, he was saying this. I'm God. And I'm still on the throne. Amen? I'm still on the throne. And I'm still in charge. And folks, the sovereignty, God never answered Job's questions. He started asking Job, where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I, when I gave you breath? Where was that with you when I made the foundation of the earth? I'm God. And then I see not only that he discovered and learned the sovereignty of God, he learned the sufficiency of God. The sufficiency of God. Turn to Job 42 real quick. Job 42. I'm glad James mentioned Job, aren't you? I'm, I'm enjoying this study. Hallelujah. Look at this. Job chapter 42, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then Job answer the Lord and said, by the way, in verse 40, he told, he, uh, Job said, I'm just, gonna, I'm just not going to open my mouth. He said, Behold, I am vow, chapter 40, verse 4, what shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. He was going, you ever done that? You, you know, that's why James says, don't grudge, don't, don't, don't swear, let your yeas be yeas. He said, and don't hold grudges, Folks, in the last days, we don't have time to pick sides and split a church. We just have time to be faithful. Souls are dying and going to hell, and churches are splitting and running the preacher off every 3.4 years. That's a disgrace. And I want to tell you something, our missionaries suffer when they come home and there's the pastors run off because people are having a Democratic Republican Party in their church. God help us. Folks, this, ain't, this is not a democracy. This is a theocracy. God rules. And this is not a dictator, this is a leader. Amen. By example and service, I hope. But I want you to look at Job. He said, I'm going to just put my hand on my mouth. I'm not going to say a word. I'm just not going to say a word. But then Job 42 is the highlight of the whole book. He said, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou can do everything. Amen. And that no thought can be withholding from thee. You know my heart. You know my heartbreak. Look at verse 3. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now. But now. Mine eye. Seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Folks, I want to tell you what your trouble ought to do. It ought to help you see Jesus. And folks, I want to say this the sufficiency of God is what you'll see when you see God. He's able because He's God. He's able to give you comfort and strength and peace in the midst of the valley. We're the only people that cry and smile at the same time. We're a bunch of schizophrenics. But I want to tell you something. The reason we can cry and smile at the same time is this world breaks our heart, but there is, this is not our world. We're going home one day. And we're going to meet our loved ones one day. It's going to be a happy reunion, Brother Tony. And folks, listen, I just want to ask you a question in closing. My time's up that I put on myself. 
No deacons ever told me how long to preach. No members told me how long to preach. Some of you have waved your calendars at me, you've waved your watches at me, and you have fallen asleep, but you're not telling me how long to preach. Amen. I appreciate that. Y'all be proud of me. I didn't preach over 35, 40 minutes the whole week. But anyway, I want to ask you this question. How many of you know God? Raise your hand. Now here's the, here's the question. How many of you know God is enough? How many of you know that God is enough? Raise your hand. That's what Job learned. In the midst of the trials, in the midst of not explaining and rebuking and cursing God, but praising God and worshiping God and not tracing God. And you know how the end of the story, Job got twice as many things as he had and even twice as many children. He had ten in heaven and ten on earth given back to him. Twice as many. But that's not the great blessing of Job. The great blessing of Job was that God gave himself to Job. And folks, the great blessing of trials and tribulations on this earth is that we have God, and we know God, and we knew we heard about Him, but then when we go through trials and tribulation where our heart is broken and it's so dark we don't know where to turn, and we're scared to death of the doctor's call or the, or the financier's call or the heartbreak of someone being disloyal and leaving you, it's great to know. God is enough. Now turn back to our text and we'll close. James chapter 5. Take my brethren the prophets, verse 10, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. But behold, we count them happy, yea, that endured. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. You read the rest of the story, amen? The devil always shows you the front yard, but never shows you the backyard. The devil always shows you chapter 1, but never shows you the end of the story. It says, And the end of the Lord, that the Lord, not Job, not the prophets, not the farmer, but Job, but not Job, but the Lord, is very pitiful. You know what that word pitiful means? Compassionate. He just cares. So God knows what you're going through and God cares what you're going through. And it says, and of tender mercy. He's compassionate and He's merciful. And friend of mine, if you've ever been through the valley, if you've ever been through the valley and you got through that valley, you not only discovered that He's God, but you've discovered that God cares. And God loves you. And God wants you to be more like Him than when you entered the valley, as you come through the valley. And He wants to see Himself in the heat and the trials as He smelts the gold. Though He slay me, I will trust Him, for I will come forth as gold. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this time to preach the Word of God of one gentleman named Job that did not recant, did not quit, but was faithful. And God, thank You that James, the point-blunt preacher that we've studied in the last six months or so, brought up a good example of a man that not only knew you, but knew that you were enough and found out how great and good and gracious you are, even in the valley of heartbreak. Lord, help us to realize that we're in a whole lot of trouble if we're not saved. We're going to eternal hell. But God, if we're saved, even trouble works for us, that all things work together for the good of them. That love God and call according to Not that all things are pleasurable. Some things break our heart. 
And some things confuse our minds. And some things just literally knock the spiritual wind out of us. But God is good to know that you're our breath. You're our strength. You're our light in the darkness. And you're the lily of the valley. So dear God, if there's one that's lost in this auditorium, this sanctuary, God help them realize they're on their own. And dear God, they cannot make it without you. And Lord, may they be saved before it's too late. 